Cool. Well, welcome everyone. My name is John Colviner, and today I'm going to be talking, doing a little intro to Angular JS. My my contact information is down below in case you you want to say good things, bad things, or indifferent. It's it's the internet after all. I even have a contact form on my website where you can give me anonymous good or bad feedback. So go for it. Uh, a little bit about me first. I'm an independent Angular JavaScript and .NET consultant. So I've been doing .NET professionally for about the last six years. And more recently, I've been doing you know, a lot of heavy JavaScript development. So I kind of started off how a lot of us have doing you know, manual. And then I kind of went on to jQuery. It was great. Knockout. Um, and now I'm, now I'm talking about Angular. I've been doing Angular for about the last year and a half. And I will say, without a doubt, it's the best UI framework I've ever used at all, just on any platform. So that's why I'm here talking to you about it. I think it's awesome. I, I want to spread the word. I want everyone to at least give it a shot and see what they like about it. Um, and also, I've been doing uh, single page app development with Angular and then without Angular for about the last last three years. So I found it to be really, um, really good way to create an application. And uh, we're actually going to do that here today. So another thing about me, too, is I'm pretty big into open source. So uh, obviously, Angular is open source, but I like to contribute too. So uh, hopefully, if we have time at the end, I've created this Angular Agility library. That's really its goal is to help reduce all that mundane stuff that you have to do with CRUD apps, like validation message generation, uh, dirty handling, uh, change tracking, um, uh, on navigate away handling, stuff like that. Which is like, yeah, every CRUD app you've ever made needs to have to do this. Angular does not have stuff for all that baked into it. So I kind of am extending it with Angular Agility. There's also, also written uh, jQuery file downloads, a uh, uh, jQuery plugin that, um, I don't know, maybe you've used it. And then uh, some knockout stuff, but I don't do knockout anymore. And I hope after you see this presentation, you won't want to do knockout either. So uh, I've done knockout for two years. So let me just let me just throw that out there. And we're going to compare to knockout here. But so a little overview of what I'm going to talk about here today. Uh, I'm going to talk about what AngularJS is, why you should care about it. And then I'm just going to kind of run down the line with comparing it to other popular frameworks that are out there really quick. And then we're going to do something totally different. We're going to, we're going to build out a new uh, social media website. And as you can tell by the logo, it's, it's going to be way different than anything you've ever seen before. And hopefully I don't get sued, right? Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to cover a bunch of core concepts, building out an app from scratch, live coding. That's most of the presentation here. And then hopefully at the end, we'll uh, cover Angular Agility. And really the objective for the presentation here is, is you should be able to leave feeling like you can start using AngularJS right away. That's kind of my goal. So that's why it's an intro talk. So what is Angular? It's, a, uh, it's an MVC framework for efficiently creating dynamic views in a web browser using HTML and JavaScript. And I have efficiently bolded and underscored there because there's a lot of ways you can do this. But I'm going to argue that none of them are as efficient as AngularJS. And that's, again, why I'm here talking to you about it today. Um, some highlights and focuses of the framework. This is huge for me. It's a, it's a complete application framework. And what I mean by that is you can get started with it. I wasn't kidding. You can get started with it today. Say you're writing some jQuery code. You know, it's, you know it kind of sucks. It's, it's not fun. Uh, you know that it'd probably be way more efficient with Angular. You can just say, you know what? This new widget I put on my page, it's going to be Angular. You can start off with it like that. That's actually how I started using it. But what I found is I got comfortable with it. And I found that it's scaled all the way up to building out. Uh, I've, I've done a 150-page 100, 150 page single-page app with Angular using the exact same sort of concept. So it scales very nicely um, to and fro there. Um, also, another huge thing for Angular that I don't think any of the other uh, major frameworks can claim right now is it's fully dynamic. So it, it embraces how JavaScript works. You're not creating uh, observables and stuff. It uses plain old JavaScript objects to do its data binding. Um, doesn't sound like much, but trust me, when you get in the weeds with it, that's huge. It makes things a lot easier um, and it, compared to something like Knockout, right? Um, also, it, it has you don't have to have jQuery anymore when you use Angular. You can have it. Um, all you get when you add jQuery is more advanced sizzle selectors when you have Angular loaded. And then you also uh, can do animations with jQuery. But I find that you, know, you, don't, you don't necessarily need it because all that low-level DOM manipulation stuff, the abstraction is baked into Angular. But what you'll find is most of the time, you don't even care about the DOM. It's a, it's a complete, really nice abstraction, but you can drop there if you'd like to. And as I kind of mentioned, it, it replaces jQuery, so it does a RESTful API interaction. It also does normal AJAX stuff like jQuery does as well. So why should you care about Angular? Well, this is kind of the, the big unfair advantage that Angular has over uh, like any, any JavaScript framework right now. It's Google's actively paying 20 Google smart people, full-time employees, to develop Angular and administrate the project. And not only that, but it's a it's an open source project as well. So that's huge. Like, 
no, no other project I'm aware of has that big of a uh, uh, you know, developer group working on it and that caliber of a developer group working on it. So that's huge. Also, you know, as Google likes, what? what it, okay, uh, a JavaScript framework. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> let, me, let me elaborate, JavaScript framework. <laughs> but if anyone knows otherwise, let me know. Um, uh, also, the thing though is Google is they like to they like to develop things and then you know walk step away from them. Well, it's on GitHub, so and it's open source. So if they do that at any time in the future, it's got a huge following already. So I think it continue will can, will continue to have that. So um, so I'm gonna make a bold statement here. Uh, I mean, obviously I love Angular. That's why I'm presenting on it. But I kind of feel like it's winning the JavaScript framework battle right now, and I will say for good reason. Let's take a look at some uh, I, I hope pretty objective evidence for this. So. The first thing I like to do when I'm comparing frameworks is let's put some frameworks in Google Trends and you know try to come up with all the different types of queries, right? Um, as you can see, Angular since about January of, of last year has taken off like a rocket ship compared to uh, Backbone, Ember, and Knockout. So that's that to me is a pretty interesting indication, but I'm not going to stop there. Uh, let's look at GitHub statistics, and these are just a couple of days old. Um, and I, I also saw when I updated the slide from earlier in the year that Angular was kind of increasing that rate of change in terms of stars and all of the different aspects that you care about on GitHub. So that's another interesting thing. It's taking the cake on, on everything, even compared to Backbone, right, which was way older. It's been around for way longer. And I don't think people usually go on GitHub and unstar things when they're not interested in it, unless they have some sort of spite against the framework. You know, they might. <laughs> I've done it before with Knockout. I'm not going to lie. Um, okay, uh, so let's compare really quickly, just going to breeze through these slides. Um, let's compare Angular to uh, some of these other frameworks. And this is kind of my Venn diagram, if you will, of JavaScript frameworks. Uh, notice how there's some overlap between Angular and jQuery. Um, that's because it has some of the core jQuery stuff baked in. It does not have animations. It does not have advanced sizzle selectors. Trust me, you will not miss them using Angular. You, but you know what? You just add jQuery. You can use jQuery right away with your Angular app if you'd like. Um, uh, you can also see that Angular sort of fully, fully does everything that Backbone and Knockout does. Um, way, way more, right? The only think framework that I've really seen that comes close is, is Ember. And uh, we'll talk about Ember here in a little bit. So jQuery, not a good comparison. The only thing jQuery is good at is doing DOM manipulation, animations, and Ajax. If you're using it, the, the cons of using jQuery, as, as we kind of already know, why you guys are all probably here at the presentation, right, is that it's a horrible choice for creating dynamic UIs. What I've found is you end up with about 10 times more sort of abstracted, hard to understand, hard to maintain code when you do something in jQuery than when you do it in, in Angular. So you learn Angular, all that sort of nastiness can, can mostly go away. And then you have new levels of nastiness to deal with with Angular. But you're, build, you're building a cool app at that point, and it's a lot easier to do. So um, very verbose. It's not MVVM or MVC. So Backbone came on the scene you know, a couple years ago to kind of solve these issues. And they said, well, let's, let's wrap these jQuery apps into sort of like neat, neat bundles and provide some models and RESTful interactions and stuff like that. Um, the cons of Backbone, though, is that it's really, it, Backbone is done. Like, it's met the goals for what it, what it was meant to solve. It's a previous generation framework. And some, some indications of that is that it doesn't do MVVM or at all. So there's no data binding. You can, you can pull it in with plugins, but you're kind of hacking away at Backbone right now. Um, it's also very verbose using, using it with jQuery. Um, it doesn't have dependency injection or anything like that, so it's not as de uh, you know, t easily testable. And really, it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be light. It's not meant to be a full-fledged full framework. And, uh, so that's, and it's not being actively developed anymore, too. So those are some indicators why you'd maybe want to shy away from Backbone. Uh, so Knockout, I, I, uh, I used to love Knockout. I actually invested a lot of time and energy into doing stuff with Knockout, even some open source projects. But I will tell you right now that um, Knockout, all it does is uh, data binding. That's, that's all it does. MVVM style data binding with observables. That, you know, some Knockout people might tell you, and there's not a lot of them, but there's a few of them out there still. It, well, it might be more performant because the way it does, uh, uh, it does dependency tracking rather than dirty checking like Angular. But you know what? I took an entire, that big single page app, I wrote it with Knockout and Durandal, which was a, uh, a now defunct uh, knockout framework for building single page apps. And uh, I converted the whole thing to Angular. And the first thing that I noticed and all the business users noticed is they're like, this is way faster. So not sure why, but in my experience so far, um, Angular has been way faster, not only to develop, I would say three, four times less code than knockout in my experience to develop with Angular, but it's more performant for at least what I've been doing. So uh, some of the cons of knockout is that it's, 
it's really complicated. You have to create these uh, observables for everything. So you can't use plain old JavaScript objects. Uh, that, and you kind of have to know what you're doing right up front. So you have your classes in, on the server, and then you have to define essentially classes in JavaScript um, in order to get those observables. And really all it does is MVVM. So I can't underscore that enough. Remember how the circle was kind of small on the, uh, on the graph? That's because it, it's, got kinda, it's kind of a one-trick pony where Angular is meant to, can be used for a lot more than that. So keep that in mind. So Ember, Ember is very similar. You know, the goals for Ember are very similar to Angular. Um, kind of the cons that I've encountered just talking to people about Ember, I've used it a little bit, and I, I do intend to uh, go to some of the Ang uh, Ember presentations today just to kind of learn a little bit more. But uh, I've heard that there's a very steep learning curve with Ember, um, and, it's, and it's pretty complicated to get over that. And it also uses, it suffers from some of the same issues that Knockout does, where you have to use observables, and it's very opinionated. You, you have to use their special types. You have to use them the way that they want you to. You can't just use plain old JavaScript objects, which work really well for Angular, right? Um, and, and really, another thing is, too, is they're, they're, it's really intended to be used for large applications, so you can't really scale between little to big like you can with Angular. So that's that's another another thing. So just kind of reviewing what, why I like Angular the best is, you know, again, it scales from a little app to a giant app or just a single part of your page, one page in your application. The plain old JavaScript objects, that's huge for me. You can, uh, just the agility, and you'll, you'll see my first demo, I'm not even gonna talk about it anymore. My first demo, you'll kind of be like, wow, that's cool. Um, also, the community and popularity of Angular is huge. Uh, to me, that's a huge consideration. Like, you may have found like some little framework that no one knows about that works really well for you, but guess what? It's a little framework that no one knows about, and unless it becomes popular, you're gonna have a hard time hiring people to work on that framework. And you may, you're probably going to end up, you know, you're not going to be able to Google and find answers to problems that you're having. So I like to choose a popular framework and be pragmatic about it when I, when I make a selection of a, a framework to use. Um, it's also, again, the most efficient UI framework I've ever used on any platform. And it also has a lot of cool stuff like dependency injection, services, factories, providers to kind of allow you to have clean, testable code. Um, we're we're going to touch on directives a little later, too, but directives are really cool. And it allows you to define like a domain specific language specific to your domain. You'll, you'll, we'll see what that looks like a little bit later if you're not familiar with DSLs. But I also really like scopes. They offer flexibility that you know, I haven't really seen in a lot of other frameworks. So I, I can say a lot of things I like about Angular. Let's talk about some things I didn't like. So this is kind of the obligatory uh, graph of learning Angular. Um, I, I definitely, anyone I've ever talked to, this is what it's like. You go up and down, you go up and down. And you're like, God, this sucks, this is great, this sucks, this is great. But I will say that you do end up, you know, after a month or two of using it, you're going to be at the top, you're going to be super productive. And I would just looking at, look at it as money in the bank when you're learning Angular. It's going to take a little while to learn, but once you get there, you're going to be like, wow, this is awesome. And I, the code that I write is so clean now as a result. So, um, yeah, well, enough of me blabbing about Angular. Let's take a look. And, you know, back in 1995 when... Uh, when you wanted people to get your attention, you would you'd put a blink tag on the page. So I, I, I will tell you right now, a lot of live coding here. I'll probably screw it up a little bit. So let me know if you see something I did wrong, and maybe maybe we can prevent it from uh, blowing up in the browser, right? So All right, let's rock and roll here. So I'm going to build a very simple hello world type application. It's going to say hello, first name, last name. And uh, so first thing I do here is I put ng app on the body element. I can put it on any element in the DOM, but it essentially says, hey, Angular, I want you to care about this portion of the DOM. Um, I want you to parse it, essentially. So we're going to do uh, hello, first name, plus last name. So that's going to be our little H1 tag there. And then we're going we're gonna to have an input, and it's going to be uh, ng model, so first name. So what, what that's doing is that's how you do the two-way data binding. That's going to bind against um, a bind against the view model, and we'll take a look at that here in a second. So you got first name, and then we're going to do last name. So okay, take it over here. First name plus last name. First name last name. Okay, so actually this is very similar to the uh, knockout hello world example. The only difference is that the knockout one requires you write some JavaScript, and it kind of shows the uh, the issues kind of inherent in knockout. So take a look at this. Oop. So there you go. Without writing any 
no magic really at all. I mean, because there's magic, but there's not, uh, you know, there's no, I didn't write any JavaScript in order to pull this off. So just right there, like, look at that. You can do something kind of cool, probably be 10, 15, 20 lines of jQuery to pull that off. Um, look at that. So that, that to me is kind of a big selling point for Angular. And you're probably like, well, geez, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of complexity going on there. There is a little bit, but that's why this is an intro talk. I'm going to explain to you how it works, and uh, hopefully, hopefully it makes sense to you guys. So first off, we put ng app on there. It basically says, hey, Angular, scan, scan this document for recognized tokens, children. And what Angular does is right away there, it creates something called root scope. Root scope is essentially, for all intents and purposes right now, a view model, right? It's a view model that we can data bind with and interact with, right? So, and what Angular does, right, as it parses the DOM, is it sees three directives. The first one is that expression, and as we saw, that expression was continuously reevaluated as we interacted with the text boxes. And then we also saw those two ng models, and those are actually two-way data bounds. So, um, I could interact with it with JavaScript code, change it, and interact with it in the DOM, and change it against the view model, which is which is root scope here. So, a little confusing. Let's uh, let's talk through it from a different angle. When I start up the application. Root scope is essentially equal to an empty object, right? And as soon as I start typing, um, well, first off, the, the expression here is evaluated to be nothing, right? Because none of the fields even exist yet, which is cool. There was no errors or anything that occurred um, when, when that happened. Um, and then I started typing, and because this is JavaScript, right? So you, you start typing in the first name field. It says, oh, I need to push the letter J into first name on root scope. Well, first name doesn't exist, but guess what? With JavaScript, you can just assign fields dynamically and remove them dynamically. So that's all Angular is doing here. So that's really powerful right there and will save you a lot of time, especially when talking with servers for JSON data and stuff. So, so that's all that's happening here. I type in John Colvener, it evaluates here, this expression evaluates, and that's that's essentially what's going on. So I've been talking a lot about scope, right? Let's let's kind of talk through the, the dry, boring, academic, um, what what is scope? And this is, this is from the Angular website. These guys are real smart, so it's really kind of, uh, hard to read, but let's talk through it. Uh, scope is an object that refers to application model. So we kind of covered that, right? It's, it's a view model. It's essentially a view model that allows us to communicate uh, between JavaScript code and views. We haven't done any JavaScript code yet, but we will do that here in a second. Um, it's also the execution context for expressions. So we also saw that too, right? This expression was evaluated against scope to, to produce like the full name essentially. Um, it's also, it also can be hierarchical um, to mimic the DOM structure. So you can actually create nested scopes, and that's a sense of huge power with uh, Angular, but also can create a lot of confusion. So we'll kind of try to talk through that here in a little bit. And then finally, um, scope can be watch expressions. So this is basically Angular's dirty checking at work here. So scope.watch here, all this is essentially doing is, let's say updated first name from JavaScript code. This scope.watch says, oh, you know, this uh, ng model just says, hey, you know what, I need to watch first name here. That's just part of what ng model does. When you give it an expression, it watches that expression, and any time it changes, it just reevaluates this function. And right in here, I'd say update the DOM with a new value, right? So that's essentially, very simply, all Angular's doing is just dirty checking when interactions in the DOM occur. And we'll, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit later, but we're also talking about uh, directives, right? All three of those things were directives. So what is a directive? It is uh, it's a reusable component for performing DOM interaction, and it's the only place in code that any sort of DOM interaction should occur. So, you know, you can actually access the element here and you can do your, your jQuery stuff if you want to, right? Um, the thing is, though, is you don't really ever have to. Or, you know, to start off with, you know, for simple applications, you don't really have to do any DOM interaction because Angular has a huge number of built-in directives. ng model was one of them, but here's a really simple example. ng show, when it evaluates to true, the text box shows up, right? When it evaluates to false, then then this, this input gets hidden. Very simple, right? Um, also, you can write your own directive. So I went online to look for a slideshow example, and of course, since it's the internet, I got pictures of cats. So hopefully you guys like the cat pictures here. Shocked cats. Um, so say you have a website where you have slideshows all over the place, right? And you're like, uh, I got designers that need to do this. You know, they don't know it, JavaScript. You can invent a slideshow element and, you know, say it has a title and it has slides, right? This is all you need to do. Just this code right here, you could pull off this slideshow just like this. So really clean, uh, really, really awesome with Angular. So, all right, since we're building a uh, social media website here, we need to have a reason for people to come back to it. So we need to have status updates, right? Big, big thing with uh, other social media websites. So I'm just gonna create a app folder here. 
And within the app folder, I'm just going to create a uh, create app.js, which is essentially just going to uh, that's where I'm going to put my first bit of, of JavaScript. So in here we got Angular dot module. So a module is just a way of organizing code with Angular, and you can associate a module with a, a portion of the or with with the DOM essentially. And we'll do that here in a second. But that empty array just says, "Hey, this this takes no dependencies." This so you can have modules depend on modules. You can build up this nice nasty dependency graph if you want with Angular. I wouldn't suggest it though. Start simple and have an established need to do that before you do it. Um, so we got a controller. We're going to call it person controller, and then it's going to take scope. So here's a dependency injection at work here. Um, person controller can interact with scope for its portion of the DOM that it's going to be applied to here in a second. But then the DOM can also interact with scope. And so there, that's our view model and that's how we get the two-way data binding. So very simple. Um, and what I'm going to do is status updates. So we're just going to do scope dot statuses equals an empty array. And then we're going to need scope dot add, add new status going to be a function. So we're just going to execute this function when they click the, the add new status button, right? And then all we're going to do very simply is use scope.statuses.push. Um, we're just going to push that object onto scope and uh, or push it onto statuses, right? Very, very simple. And we're just going to have a uh, text. We're going to have scope.new status. So notice what I did here. Uh, I haven't defined new status anywhere. I'm going to add a text area in the DOM that ng model binds to new status. Uh, another way you could do it too, you know, would be to pass it in. This is one way of doing it. You know, Angular is flexible, so you can kind of do it whatever way you want. And then we're going to have a date, right? And that's just going to be new date. And then finally, at the end here, after adding the new status, we want to uh, we want to clear out scope dot new status, right? Because They've entered their status. We don't want it to show up anymore in the text area. So we're just going to clear that out. Let me check my code here. Live coding's hard. It's good to have a cheat sheet. Um, okay. And all right, so we'll come back here, right? And first thing I need to do before I forget, this always, this always kills a live demo. You forget to add the script tag, right? So we'll do that. App.js. So remember how I said, uh, and so ng app can be associated with a particular module. So we're just going to do that. This is why I like using WebStorm right here. $50, full featured IDE. I have in presentation mode. It, it can look like Visual Studio or IntelliJ if you want. But look at that. Autocomplete right there. It understands Angular. I can even go back and forth and click on it and whatever, right? That's really cool for me. It really helps with Angular. It, it helps you understand your code that you've been writing. Um, and it allows you to kind of give you autocomplete. So another thing here. So I'm creating a control. I created the controller, right? Well, the controller needs to interact with a portion of the DOM, which is its scope. So here I got autocomplete ng controller. What did I call it? Person controller. And again, I can I can go here and click on it and go to person controller. So would highly recommend trying out IntelliJ. It's a 30 day free trial. They're not even paying me. I just really like it. So give it a shot. I mean, WebStorm. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, so we have person controller here, and well, on person controller, we have a, a list of statuses and the ability to add a new status, right? So let's do that. We'll do a div, we'll say uh, h1, uh, what's going on, first name. And then we're gonna have a uh, uh, text area to do text area. Cool part about Angular 2 is all the, all the data binding occurs with the same directive ng model with knockout there's one for like every different kind of input type which is kind of annoying so uh, let's see here we called it new status here so we got new status and then we want to be able to add that so we'll do that with a button and so add new status ng click so ng click is how you uh, how you execute a function against scope very simply so we called it add new status. So now I can execute that function against scope. Yep, that looks good. Um, and then so the last thing we need to do here is we can add a new status and we just need to, we want to loop out the different statuses that have you know been in the DOM. So how you do that with Angular is ng repeat. This will actually loop out uh, each div element over and over again. So something to keep in mind, some frameworks will have like a comment around the, the div or something like that. So for each status in statuses, 
And let's just make sure that looks good here. Statuses, yep. So, and then we're just gonna use the data binding here and we'll say at um, um, status.date, person said status.text. All right, let's look this over here. Anyone see any issues? It's getting a little, getting a little hairier here. Um, all right, give it a shot. So I got the debugger open, right? Okay, John Colviner. What's going on, John? Hope this works, please. There we go. So just like that, built kind of a cool little uh, single pagey type application. Very straightforward, simple code. Again, you'd have way more jQuery in order to pull this off. Way more knockout code too, trust me. So, and, so a couple things to note here. This looks kind of crappy. I would expect the ordering to be inverted, right? Uh, by date. I'd also expect dates to not be uh, UTC time. I like UTC time because then it's not Hawaiian time or Eastern time or, or Central time. And I know what time it is. I like the Z at the end, but users don't really like that, right? They're not developers. So I'll show you a way to fix that here in a second. But let's just talk about what we just did here. So what is a controller? A controller is just a fancy name for a scope container. Um, so what I mean by that is controller can obviously interact with scope the portion of the DOM that the controller envelops can also interact with scope, and it's the controller scope that we're interacting with here. Um, what we created here is essentially root scope. This, uh, we had root scope to begin with, right? And we have a controller within root scope. The controller's scope prototypically inherits from uh, root scope. So what that means is that uh, person controller scope is sort of isolated. It can interact with itself there. But say you know, uh, something in, the, in DOM in there wanted to interact with something on root scope, it could. So it can reach out of scope and it, it prototypically resolves up, but be, beware of uh, shadowing that can occur with, uh, with prototypical inheritance. And uh, yeah, that's just something you gotta kinda watch out for. I'm not gonna get into it. What's up? Um, yep, yep, exactly. In person controller, I can do that. Yep, and uh, also um, say I had something on root scope, uh, something called like uh, app, app name or something, right? I could, I could interact with it from person controller via scope because it prototypically resolves up. So that's, uh, so what was that? Okay. Yep, you could override it, but uh, you can't overwrite fields. They have to be uh, references. Uh, I don't know, it's a long, it's, it's, it's JavaScript. We're here at a JavaScript conference, right? Have fun, guys. Um, so what's a controller? Controller is really just a directive that is configured to prototypically inherit from its parent. So. It's, it's really nothing, it's like a three line directive. That's all a controller is. And you're probably like, uh, what, what are you talking about? Okay, well, let me explain here. We have root scope, uh, the, is the root scope. Then we have person controller, which prototypically inherits from it. It's just a directive, that's all a controller is. And guess what? Um, we have a bunch of other directives, right? Let me explain that statement I just made. So ng model, right, does not create scope. You cannot put an element inside of an input, right? So all it's doing is data binding to its parent here, so their their uh, ng model just interacts with the scope of whatever it's on, essentially. Um, but if you take a look, statuses. If you think about it, um, ng repeat, it's looping out a bunch of statuses. Um, within within each of that, you could have a div, right? Within there, you might want to have some some code that's isolated, right? You're doing something in there. Um, you don't want to have you don't want to have it reflect across the entire person controller scope. So each one creates an isolated scope which again then prototypically inherits back up the chain. So this is probably the most confusing part about Angular, and it's also one of the most powerful things with Angular. So let me kinda, I'm gonna use the Angular Batarang plugin here. Angular Batarang, like the thing that Batman throws, uh, yeah, I don't know why they named it that, but that's cool, right? So here's the scopes, right? I started off, I got root scope, I got controller scope, right? Very simply, you can explore it with the Batarang plugin. Very nice, as I start typing, John Colviner, we can see it shows up here on scope. Nice, and then as I go, uh, I'll do A. Look, new status showed up, B. So as you can see, controller has a list of statuses on it, but then each status within there gets its own scope. So A, B, just like that. So a little confusing, uh, getting out, start out with Angular, this is a great tool to kind of help you, help you understand what's going on. Um, Another awesome thing with this tool is you can select an area of the DOM like I just did here, and I can also type scope.firstName, and I can actually interact with the, just like that. So I can interact with whatever scope I want um, external to my JavaScript code in the, in the debugger, which is, which is really awesome. It helps you, helps you really uh, figure out what's going on. 
So another problem we have right now is the, the, the dates don't look very good, right? They, uh, the dates don't look good and the ordering's wrong. So the Angular team in their, in their infinite wisdom here came up with something called filters, which allows you to, so normally what would you do? You would fix this in your JavaScript code. You'd say, I want my, uh, I want my dates to be inverted. So I'm gonna use uh, load ash and I'm gonna sort them in my JavaScript code. Well, guess what? The, the code really shouldn't be dictating how um, the view displays data. So Angular says, hey, you know what? We have something called filters. You know, the model just, the scope just has whatever the model is on it. And then the view decides how it wants to display it. So that's kind of the, the thought here. And I actually really like it. It's a good paradigm. So we're just gonna invert the order of the statuses here real quick. Um, so we're gonna do order by the filter. We're gonna order by, whoops, order by date. And true just says invert it, right? And so that's, that's, that's gonna fix our ordering issue right there. And then we also want the dates to display friendly like, right? So we're gonna do date medium. So we could also do the month, month, day, day, year stuff, but we don't have time to do that, right? And that's, that's annoying. So, so we got a medium date format now. Let's come back here and uh, A, B, C. So look at that, inverted it, uh, very simple, very clean. Um, arguably, I would say it's in the right spot putting it in JavaScript code is not the right spot because what if you have two views that use the same controller and they display the data differently, right? Uh, the, the model is not a, a place to worry about the display concerns in my opinion. And great, great separation of concerns there. So what is a filter? Uh, it's just a function that transforms an input into an output. I know coming from .NET, it reminds me of like link extension methods with lambdas where you can pipe things into each other. Uh, I, I said piped, well, I've been doing a lot of Unix stuff recently, so it's also like uh, piping stuff in Unix where you can basically just transform inputs into outputs into inputs into outputs. You can create your own. Angular, ha you know, what I've found is I generally, I generally don't have a need to. Uh, most, of the time, um, most of the time, you can just use the built-in Angular filters to accomplish what you're doing, but you can certainly write your own. The framework is very extensible in that manner. So another thing that applications need, right, is validation. and. Let me just, let me just uh, illustrate to you the problem with our app as it stands right now. Look at that, people can put empty status updates. How pissed would you be if you went on Facefolio's competitor and you saw a bunch of blanks on the page? That'd be horrible. You might still be able to pull that off. I don't know how clever they are, but um, yeah, so there we go. We wanna fix that. How we're gonna do that is with validation. What I'd like to do is just lock down that button until it's valid. And so how, so let me just sort of illustrate what we do to do that. So I'm gonna close this out here. We use something called ng form for validation. I'm just gonna call it uh, status form. So what I've done here is I've created something called status form on scope by doing this. And I want to validate that text area meets a couple requirements. I want, to, I, want, I want it to be required. So I can use this baked into Angular, just a directive. You could write your own validation rule in a directive if you'd like. It also has one called ng min length. ng min length, let's say it has to be 10 characters, right? So there we go. So we've, we've said this is required. It has a min length. But one little gotcha with Angular is in order for it to participate in form validation, you also have to give it a name. So, um, so what I've created here, I'm just gonna use the same, uh, same name as what the ng model is. So right now we have scope.newStatus, which contains the value of whatever I've typed there. We also have something called scope.statusform.newStatus, which has a pr bunch of properties on it that you can assess to figure out the validity of new status, you can assess the validity of the form that it's in, um, stuff like that. So really, really kind of cool. You're probably a little confused. Let me just show you what this looks like here. So I'm gonna disable the button if status form dot new, status form dot new status is invalid. So that right there is an object that I've created by creating this DOM structure. I could also say is status form Status form dot invalid would be another thing I could do. So let's take a look here and uh, refresh. Look at that, the button's disabled, very simple. Um, I type some, still disabled, type 10 characters, now it's enabled. Something really cool that the Angular team, like you're, you're, you can right away wow all the, you know, wow your business or wow all the developers on your team. Take a look at this. Um, if I look at this uh, input here, look at that, Angular's actually applied classes based on the validity of the input. So guess what that means? You can have a green box around it when it's valid and when it's invalid, it, uh, it can be red. So you can kind of, in a couple lines, write CSS rules and just have, have your application look really cool and flashy. So that, that to me is like, oh wow, that's really clever they did that. So 
now you can wow everyone with your, your angular skills and, and you're like, wow, all the boxes on our site are now green and red and stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, so in order for ng-form to work, you have to have a name and an ng-model on each input. Um, uh, ng-form also allows for validation of collections of controls. So I could have a form with 100 controls in it, an ng-form with 100 controls in it, and the form name dot dollar valid or dollar invalid would reflect the validity of all the sub uh, sub controls in it. You can even nest forms if you want to get real crazy. So uh, that all works. Um, CSS rules uh, for the validity of elements. And then um, there's a bunch of validation directives built in. Here's a sampling of some of them. But you can also uh, you can also write your own. So it's all extensible. You can write your own to meet your particular business domain requirements. Um, and so you're probably like, oh, this validation stuff seems like kind of a pain. Well, I, I agree. And another problem with it is that if you want to have a message that says first name is required, you actually have to uh, you actually have to code that out uh, every time. You have to generate like so. What I've written is Angular Agility form extensions makes all that really easy. It's a it's a DSL for Twitter Bootstrap or whatever UI framework that you're using. You can generate a kind of pretty awesome form in one line of code for each field, which is how I think it should be. Like I don't like copying and pasting ten lines of Twitter Bootstrap crap in order to you know have a single form field, right? So uh, we'll take a look at that a little bit later, but um, so face folio is it's getting it's getting grown up here, right? We got uh, a status feed with some statuses. We got uh, we got some links here where we can look at the different people in face folio. Let's take a look here. We're going to use our our get time machine, and uh, we're going to go to uh, refactor. So now it's a single page app, and so we've got. So a status feed page, you know, a list of statuses, and then we've got, uh, if we can click on John Colvener, we can see that, well, the statuses aren't there, that's weird. Let's try uh, foo, do some typing, all right, let's refresh the page, oh, it went away. Well, that's what our ne next task is here, is, is to uh, uh, do some RESTful API interaction using uh, resource. So, as you can see, the status feed also doesn't reflect, but it will once we're done with this here. So, let's... Uh, what, what did we do here? Well, since this JavaScript conference, we use Node for this. It's like, it's like 40 lines in Node for this entire API. It's pretty cool, you know, using Express, right? So what we care about here is that we have uh, all the RESTful API stuff that we need in order to interact with statuses. So, um, and that's what we're going to, you know, this is actually going to play into how we use resource. We have a RESTful API, so we can use resource. I'm not going to cover the sort of jQuery type interactions you can do. You can you can do HTTP.get and post and all that stuff works just like jQuery. We're going to focus on something that will save you time if you have a RESTful API. So um, another thing to note here too is that Facefolio is now a single page application. So uh, it has multiple virtual pages. And what I mean by that is as you navigate around the site as we just did, the DOM never unloads. Think of this application as an app running on your iPhone. The only difference is the execution environment at this point. It's interacting with an API just like your iPhone app does. Um, and arguably it can be a lot lighter than your iPhone app, which is why I really love the web. It's, and it runs everywhere, right? You don't have to learn Objective-C or Swift, which I've heard is kind of buggy right now, right? So pretty cool. Um, it, it, the data is loaded in with Ajax and JSON. So it's just doing a hash change. Notice how the hash changes. Um, Angular has a router that the Angular team wrote, and then there's the Angular UI router, which has a lot more features. I would suggest um, using just the Angular UI router to start off with, because if you're building out kind of a mean single page app, you're probably gonna want the features that it has anyways. So, but the Angular router is much simpler, so you might be able to go there. Um, let's take a look here. We want to, uh, we want to use resource to uh, do create, read, update, and delete on these statuses here. So let's just come here and let's, uh, Let's take a look. Um, all right, so I've refactored the application. There's a lot of uh, ways you can structure an Angular app. It's JavaScript. You can do whatever you want. I tend to like to have a folder for each like area. So we have person here. I could put person.last here, person.sass or whatever in here. I could have the HTML JavaScript all nicely organized. No views folder and JavaScript's folder. Um, as you've kind of done with, you know, maybe Groovy Grails or, or like uh, ASP.NBC. You don't have to, you can do whatever convention you want. And I find that this works for me. So uh, let's take a look at person.js, right? So remember person.js, it looked like this before. Well, it still looks pretty much like this other than, you know, loading the person from the server. So what we want to do here is we want to load the statuses for the person. 
So how we're going to do that is we're going to use resource. So we're going to call it person, person status. So this is confusing. Um, you're going to be like, why would you use resource? But I'll, I'll show you here in a second. So let's go to server.js. Here's my node app, right? I have this route. This is the full blown route. If you think about it, rest, rest wise, the lead is always going to be the longest route that you have and resource understands how rest works. So I'm just going to use, um, I'm going to use resource and I'm just going to copy and paste this route in here from node and what I'm going to do here is I, I want to, in order to interact with uh, this resource, which I fully defined here, uh, first off, if you think about it, I'm on, a, I'm on a page for a particular person. If I reload this page with a new person, it's a new controller instance. So what we want to do here to start off with is just hard code the ID. So this object is saying like, okay, ID here matches up to ID here. I could just hard code it in a string too, just illustrating a point, right? State params ID is simply the route. So if we look at this is what Angular UI router does, right? We got, we got this, that's the route. So it's person ID one, right? Very simple. So we got that and let's, uh, the other thing we need to think about, so say we have a delete, right? We need to use this fully qualified, uh, fully qualified path in order to perform a delete. So if you think about it, we need to pass in the ID of the object. And I know that the ID of the object is, is just, um, you know, status.id, right? So what I do here with routers, I do id. So what this is, introspectively, it's weird. It says, oh, this at and this string, let's get the uh, value off of the object and plug it in here when we perform a delete. Yeah, trust me, it's, it's, it's kind of confusing. When I first used it, I was like, oh, why? why would anyone do that? Like, this is horrible. Well, let me show you why I would suggest giving it a shot. Um, if you have a RESTful API, and also don't, don't force yourself to have a RESTful API. Uh, REST seems to be kind of a cool buzzword these days. And, it, you know, if you have an RPC style endpoint, use your RPC style endpoint if it works for you. Not everything is like Twitter and Facebook where you can just post to something and have it work. Sometimes you have a business process around it, right? So uh, be smart about using REST. If you are using REST, you can give resources a try. And so we're going to do query statuses and we're just going to do it like this. So we, we don't, we don't want to have it be an empty array anymore, right? We want to have it. Uh, we want to have it be loaded from the server, right? So um, that's all we have to do. I guess we need to run this function too. Um, but that's why I really like using resource if I can because it's very simple. So that's that's really simple. Uh, Angular resource understands what RESTful API essentially endpoint signatures look like. So that right there will just query the statuses and pop it right onto the array which is pretty cool. You don't even have to do a promise, um, which, is, which is nice. So we want to add a new status, but instead of pushing onto the array here, we'd like, to, uh, we'd, like to, we'd like to just push it onto the server and we'll just re-query from the server once we send it to the server. So how we do that is, and this is funky thing number two with resource, right? Um, status, new person status. So what I just did here is I created a new instance of this resource that I've defined here. And what that means is now this new instance has full blown ability to interact with the RESTful API signature that I've, I've spelled out there, right? So really cool, right? The reason why I like doing this, you're like, uh, that's weird. It's, it is weird. Um, I can do this though. So that's all I need to do in order to save, which, which is, that to me is, you know, worth the price of admission if you have a RESTful API and don't force it, right? Um, and then and once, I, once I save, I can uh, query statuses again. So we'll just call query statuses. And uh, so we're going to save it. That query statuses is the callback. It'll run, refresh the statuses from the server, right? Um, we could also do delete. I'll just show you what delete looks like. I'm not actually going to put the delete button in there, but delete function. We're going to take a status. We're passing a status in. So, um, and then we can just say status dot delete and then refresh. You're probably like, well, wh why is that status that's getting passed in have a delete? Well, if you think about it, all the statuses that we have right now have come from this query, right? And it, it resources like, oh, you got this from this, uh, you know, query. I'm going to fix these special little uh, functions on here that allow you to interact. So. Um, it, it magically has the function save on it, the function delete, 
And it all works because you've fully explicitly spelt out your uh, API. I mean, this, this right here using, you know, normal um, Angular HTTP would end up being a, you know, probably like 10, 10, 15 more lines of code. And it's, if you understand the paradigm involved with resource, um, it, you know, it makes your code cleaner, right? Well, okay, I want to write a directive here, folks. Okay, and uh, so what I want this directive to do is I want it to, I want it to lock down. So you've been on like sites like this, right, where you have your name, right? You, you don't want to be able to come in here and fat finger and, uh, you know, change your name by mistake. So I'm going to create this directive called field locker, which we can wrap around each input in order to lock it down. We click an unlock button to unlock it. So let me show you what this API looks like here. So I'm going to go to uh, person.html. So it looks the same as it did before, right? Um, I'm going to create a directive whose API signature looks basically like this. I'm going to say uh, it's going to be called uh, field locker. And when field locker is locked, I'd like it to display the value of person.firstName. When it's unlocked, I want you to show the input that's in here, right? Pretty simple. Let's, uh, let's do the same for, for, down, for down below here. Field locker, div, and uh, person.lastname. So that's, that's very simply what we want our API to look like. And then uh, I'm going to create my directive here quick. I'm just going to put it on app.js. You can put it wherever you want. We're going to call it field locker. You're probably looking at this right now and saying, well, what the heck? Why is that camel case? Well, Angular team, for better or for worse, uh, think about it, stuff in, stuff in HTML is always hyphenated, so it assumes a convention of something that's hyphenated goes to something that's camel case in JavaScript. You'll get burned by that once or twice, right? Um, good idea, bad idea. I, I tend to like it now. So let's define our template here for field locker. Only bit of non-live coding. Um, I essentially want my template when the, this is what it's going to be replaced with, the entire section of the DOM there. When it's locked, I want to show the value when it's unlocked, though, I want to show the text box. And all transclude does is a fancy name for take the original contents of the DOM here, the original contents of what I put field blocker on, and inject it in an arbitrary place in my template. So that's all that's happening here. So when it's unlocked, it just shows up right in there. Um, also, I can click, I, I can evaluate a, a function directly here on ng click. Maybe not a good practice, but I say when you click the button, unlock unlock it on scope, which will in turn cause um, the text box to, to show up, right, in this case. So a couple things I need to do here, too. Replace true. That's going to replace the entire DOM with, with the contents of this thing, or replace the entire uh, section of the DOM where I put the field blocker. Uh, transclude true. I, I think transclude might be a made-up word by the Angular team. Um, it sounds really, you can tell your friends, yeah, I learned about transcludes today, but don't tell them how really simple it is. It really, like, I hope you guys get it. It's, it's pretty simple what it's doing here. So, um, scope. Oh, God, okay. Well, yeah, look at their, look at their website. There's a lot of that. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, oh, so maybe they did make it up. Nice. <laughs> so I'm going to start this thing off. Locked equals true. Uh, so link is, this is not dependency injection. It's a fixed arguments, list of arguments. Also notice here, element. You can, you can go and go jQuery crazy here with this element if you want. You know the secret where you can interact with the DOM. But guess what? I'm not going to interact with the DOM here. I don't need to. I'm also going to show you here. So scope.watch. Um, this is not, I will tell you right now, is not the most efficient way to do this. There's a better way. You could do this in one line. Um, in terms of the, the API as it exists in the DOM, but this illustrates a couple interesting points, so I'm doing it this way. So what I want to do is I want to take at whoop, excuse me, attributes.fieldlocker. And I want to uh, I want to take so what I've done here. Uh, excuse me, let's go here. Attributes just refers to the uh, attributes on the element, right? So I'm taking person.firstname, which is just simply passed in to the string. And I'm saying, you know what? I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to take the value of that. I want to watch it. So anytime person dot first name changes, evaluate this function. So, and then I want to set it equal to scope dot, or excuse me, scope dot value. And what that's going to do is this value will always reflect what the text box reflects, right? 
it'll keep it synced up, right? So let's take a look here. Take a look at our cool new directive that we wrote. Oh, what the heck? Okay, intentional bug I put in the presentation to help explain how scopes work, right? Notice how it says Colvinor twice. Well, that's weird, and you'd probably spend quite a while scratching your head on why that occurred. Let me, let me run through it for you with you really quick. So field locker directive runs twice, right? The first time it runs, it sets value. This watch triggers once, and it sets value on scope equal to John. The second time it runs, it sets value on scope equal to Colvinor. Well, guess what? These directives, they, they do have a, a, a child element in them, but they're actually running against the same scope. I haven't said use prototypical inheritance here. So this is why scopes are really powerful. So right now I can just do this, scope true, drop it on there. And what that will do is create prototypical inheritance. So now I, I, these, these guys, are they can access their parent scope, but they, they can operate on the scope in isolation, which is what we want. We want value for each one to be different, right? So we can unlock, we can type in Johnny, we can save. We can refresh because I didn't cover all the bases here. Look at that, pretty cool. So one other thing I'd like to show you guys real quick before you go, um, probably got like two, two, three minutes left here before uh, five before. Um, Angular Agility, if you're building a CRUD app with Angular, try it out. I've used it on, I've kind of perfected it on many different applications I've worked on, open source. Uh, number one goal, remove the mundane, every CRUD app I've ever written has all this stuff in it. Like uh, stop copying and pasting stuff, right? The other number two goal is that, well, it needs to be configurable, right? How many times have you used a jQuery plugin that maybe does validation messages and you're like, oh, I want the, the message to be up here, not down here. And, and the only way to change it is for me to hack the crap out of the source code. Well, I don't like doing that. I don't want to, I don't want to be enabler of that. So everything is uh, configurable with a, a strategy pattern for pretty much everything in the, uh, the thing. So what it does quite simply is it generates AngularJS form fields, labels, rich validation messages, error notifications, um, it's a DSL for Twitter bootstraps. You can generate a 10 line thing in one line of HTML um, using this or whatever UI framework you're choosing. Um, it, also, um, it also does uh, form field validation message generation so you don't have to type, type it out. It also does form change tracking, form resets, loading indicators, on navigate away warning, stuff like that. Like, uh, so let me just show you here what it does. Hopefully you guys think it's cool. Um, so take a look at my form here. This is online, just Google Angular Agility. First, first hit on Google. Um, I got a form here, right? Uh, if I'm in a field and I tab out of it, I'd like a message to show up, right? You have the ability to make it valid. Also, when I'm in here, um, I'd also like to, you know, if I type in John, col John at colviner.com, you know, it's valid now, it's green. I can type some stuff here. Notice how we also have error notifications showing up. If I try to submit the form with it being invalid, it blocks. It doesn't, it doesn't try to call the function, which is another thing you'll have to code manually with Angular. If you have an invalid form, don't call this function, right? So it, it kind of fixes all that. Um, let me just go here, uh, favorite letter. Um, another thing to note that it does too, think of it as like a gated ng click. If I click save here, um, it'll actually it'll actually lock the button down, prevent you from hammering the button, um, and also loading indicator. So, one one more quick thing. So this form, right? Uh, this form before form extensions looks pretty much like this. It's a monster, right? Because you have to manually code out all this stuff with Angular. You have to code out the label manually. You have to code out the emails required. Uh, must be a valid email address. You also have to say, okay, if it's dirty and there's an invalid submit attempt or the field is required, um, you know, show the message, right? Well, let me just show you here what it looks like with form extensions. This is our entire form. Even after gzipping, it's 55% smaller and it's really highly readable. You can understand what's going on here. Um, and I'll just kinda, I'll show you what, what this is doing and then we'll let you guys get out of here. So normally you'd have to type something like this to pull off the email thing, right? But with Angular Agility, you can say, hey, you know what? distill this down with a DSL to the bare minimum that you need to know to pull this off. So what I'm doing here is it's input type equals email. That implicitly means that it must say, you know, email is required. Um, if it's got a required field on here, it's a, or sorry, you know, vice versa. Um, so it, it'll actually auto generate all that. It even generates the label because, you know, generally by default, you want your label to be whatever the uh, camel, decamel case version of the variable name is, right? So you can have first name and it'll do first space name and it'll put a star on it if it's required because the, 
the default uh, strategy says put a star on labels if they're required. So yeah, that's pretty much it here. Um, we also got, see there's on navigate away handling. Uh, it'll prevent me from navigating away. Um, if, and that, that works with uh, Angular UI router or you can customize it. Also, if I try to refresh, you know, hard refresh, it'll block that too. Um, also, you know, we'll let, let you guys leave here on this, uh, you know, form change tracking, dirty tracking, also in the advanced demo. So um, yeah, it was great. It was great chatting with you guys here. We'll let you get out of here. Let me know if you have any questions or comments. Thanks a lot.